Good morning from all around the world and welcome to Structural Hard Life Cases, broadcasting directly from the Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. My name is Dr. Pedro Moreno. I'm professor of medicine and interventional cardiologist and director of quality for Mount Sinai Cardiology. We um, welcome for the, our case today. And most importantly, before we start, remember to please register for our virtual transcatheter valve course on Thursday, December the 10th at www nytranscatherervalves.org. The course directors, Dr. Sharma, Dr. Kinney, Dr. Tang, Lerakis, and Dr. Meran will be featured with uh, registered lectures as well as two great live cases and live questions and answers directly from the cath lab. Now, remember, we love to hear from you today, so please send us all your questions directly from the website. And now we have a fantastic case. Let me transfer you directly to the cath lab for Dr. Sharma and Kinney. Okay. Good morning to our viewers of Structural Live Webcast. And uh, here is our team, myself, Dr. Kinney on the left side. On the right side, Dr. Tang. We are Dr. Sail Khera and uh, our fellow Sunny. And of course, the rest of the cath lab staff, uh, which are all here, uh, along with, uh, if uh, while we are doing this, so we can just go back to the slide so that we show uh, all the participants uh, in this uh, presentation uh, of the today's very complex case. Uh, I don't know, yeah. So this is basically uh, sponsored by uh, our the supporters, which are shown here, and uh, all partners uh, shown individually. Uh, with the, everyone's name, including uh, Larakas, uh, is on the imaging. Dr. Moreno, of course, is the moderator, and we have cardiac anesthetist Dr. Moe Trin. So, uh, with all the team trying to present you uh, a special uh, case here, knowing this is what going to happen more and more now, particularly when we are getting this uh, valve, uh, particularly the the tower approved for low risk in younger patients who are living longer. So this case, uh, while we are just getting ready with the uh, the case itself, let me just present, take you up speed to 60 year old patient who has progressive fatigue and dyspnea for last two to three months. Uh, this patient has an end stage renal disease on hemodialysis and had a aortic uh, valve disease few years ago and had a bioprosthetic AVR in 2017 using uh, the Edward Magna 3023 millimeter. So you say that it's barely lasted about three years. At that time, patient's age was 56, 57 years of age. So three, four years ago. Now, Gilbert, you want to comment on that? This, although it is a uh, patient was on hemodialysis, but to have valve degenerated surgical valve within three years, it's a little unusual. Yeah, no, especially for the bovine pericardial valve from, from Edwards, uh, typically the durability is quite good. We've seen some of those in our clinic. Uh, but this patient, as you saw, has a lot of comorbidities. Uh, the one most uh, predictor associated with early valve degeneration is dialysis, especially right. when you're patient on young, well, young, younger, uh, undergoing bioplastic valve. So, yeah. uh, and, it's a, and you can see an echo in Dr. Lorapka's show, it's very much a stenotic male. So then question comes in, it looks the same uh, bad situation. You can use that wire also. Remember that other wire we used? Yeah. So the so question is, will that be the similar story when you use the our the tower valve, which is also have this bioprosthetic material, and how long standing will that be? Although clearly we know that renal failure, uh, in no matter in what capacity it is, it is always associated with a uh, bad outcome on a long run uh, with the higher event rate and higher, of course, the valve degeneration. We actually have a very expert, uh, the renal guru of uh, the Mount Sinai of America and world, Dr. Roxana Mehran. So because she's one of our, uh, the five, uh, the director of the valve uh, conference, and uh, she actually has joined, gracefully joined here, and maybe can say about the specific question. We know the, the surgical valve, the surgical valve has a high no, degeneration, patient with the, the uh, aortic uh, 
Yeah. In the okay. surgical, uh, that patient with the hemodialysis has a rapid deterioration of the aortic valve. Now question is, this patient is only 60. We know he has a lot of comorbid condition. But what is our expected future of the tower valve in this particular case, knowing that patient has a, he is on hemodialysis? I know the comorbid conditions will play a major role in patient longevity. But what do we know more about the renal failure, hemodialysis, and the tower valve? So obviously, the hemodialysis patients are the highest risk, right? I mean, Gilbert, you have an issue with, uh, you know, in, in the surgical uh, replacement, this is a, a really big issue. And I think in dialysis, this is not about worsening renal function because you're already on a renal replacement therapy, but, but certainly these are the patients who are at the highest risk for periprocedural issues. And then their hemodynamic functions post in, with a valve and valve is gonna be incredibly important. And I guess that may be the reason for the choice of the valve today, because I think we all have to also think about the choice of the valve in these patients, depending on the size, depending on the comorbidities. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, we don't have a lot of data on valve and valve uh, in maybe up to five years so far. There was a recent partner registry on TCT uh, Cornet that was mm -hmm. performed with reasonable outcomes. But uh, one of the challenges with valve and valve versus valve and native valve is that the transcatheter valve will be constrained inside a surgical valve. And you will see today in a live case that we'll plan to fracture the surgical valve to maximally expand the transcatheter valve uh, so that we can maximize hopefully the Yeah, the so fracking or yeah. fracturing <laughs> the valve is very important. But yeah. these, as you said, Dr. Sharma, the hemodialysis is not about worsening renal function at no. this point, but it's about everything else, bleeding, yeah. stroke, yeah. Uh, the, uh, the best hemodynamic possibility acutely. Yeah. So I actually, over the years, I have encountered few cases who are degenerated in five years, four to five years in hemodialysis. I can tell you that three years, this will be the uh, shortest I have. Yes. It's now, amazing. we are not talking about endocarditis. No. We are not talking about thrombosis, which can rarely happen. But we are talking about the valve degeneration, like happened to this patient with the both uh, uh, stenosis and little regurgitation, having within three years occurring, uh, and whether it is related to how frequently patient is dialyzed, what is the level of creatinine, their calcium, it's uh, really the phosphorus calcium, levels, isn't it? many other things. Yeah, uh, could be. actually, Dr. Sharma, yeah. one of the issues here is what is called dystrophic calcification, which yeah. is the presence of calcium outside the bones, which is characterized or characterizes the disease, vascular disease in patients on dialysis, and is related to this hyperparathyroidism that is called tertiary hyperparathyroidism. And some data which is evolving actually showing that the level of parathyroid hormone, sometimes over a thousand, may actually play a role. So it's, a, it's an evolving target and a very complex issue in these patients that actually hampers prognosis. Very good point. Now this patient, uh, surprisingly, he actually used to have a low EF. Uh, at time of surgery, it was about 40, mm. 40, 42. Now it is between 20 and 25. CAD is only moderate, which has been managed medically, and we will show actual echo uh, in terms of the valve. So maybe uh, STEM can show now from the valve point of view, the, uh, the latest echo report was EF of 20% and uh, was felt that very high peak velocities and so, and there is no uh, prosthesis patient mismatch. Maybe uh, STEM can uh, enlighten us with the actual, uh, we can put the echo on the screen and he can talk about that now. Get the guide. Structural imaging fellow, Dr. Anastasius. As you can see, uh, this is a uh, four chamber view. And you can appreciate the very poor ejection fraction, about 20-25%. Uh, also, the right ventricle is uh, decreased in fraction, at least moderate. This is the prosthetic valve, as you can see, uh, x plane, severely stenotic, severely calcified. You cannot even see the anterior part of the annulus because of the heavy calcification. This is with color, and you can see turbulent flow because of the significant severe stenosis and mild aortic regurgitation. Always we evaluate uh, to make, make sure that we can see the left main. As you can see here, the left main is seen very well. And we make this point, uh, especially after the new valve is deployed. Uh, this is a gastric view. Uh, as you can appreciate again, the very severely depressed LV function, the very severely stenotic aortic valve with mild AI. And the gradients here, we get a mean gradient of 52, even with a very low ejection fraction of about 20-25%, very severely stenosed valve, 0.4 centimeters square by the continuity equation. Dr. Sarma, back to you. 
crossing the valve which you used to use. So, any any mitral any any other valve the, uh, disease? Yeah, we, we do not. Uh, the he has mild to at most moderate MR hmm? and uh, mild to at most uh, moderate TR. Yeah. Left atrial appendix clean. We do not show this for the interest of time. But uh, those other lesions are mild to moderate. Okay. Okay, let's uh, move the slide further. So, I think so many people in the in the audience may be questioning with this degree of left ventricular systolic dysfunction, which 25% uh, is a little generous, I think, uh, STEM, what is the prognosis after relieving the gradient? Um, Dr. Tang or Dr. Sharma, you want to comment on it? Would you think yeah. that ventricle will come back? You're in the right, I, right. Cusp. I hope so. Yeah. I, I think, I think it might with improved hemodynamics. I mean, that's do do? sort of where we are with patients like this, yeah. right? He's a 60-year-old yeah. man. Of course, he's just dependent, but still, we want to give him every single possible chance. And I do believe that with improving hemodynamics, he's going to get better, and his LV function will come back. Completely in agreement, Roxana. I think that's a very important point. The fact that the patient can generate right. four meters per second in the peak velocity suggests that the contractile reserve and seen with the thickness of the ventricle on the echo is going to come back. You know, aortic stenosis is one of the pathologies that have complete recovery of the systolic function when you relieve really? the, the really? obstruction in the absence of this coronary disease. Okay, so um, the, the onload uh, trial, actually, the, the data based on the onload showed that the ejection fraction improves both in patients with and without contractile reserve after TAVR in, in, this, in this disease. So it's a very good point and nothing to be afraid of, although the periprocedural risks are there increased when compared to normal EF. Of course, of course, absolutely. And I think the yellow one was the best. Yeah, so you can see while we are working across the valve, that uh, the patient's STS score for um, aortic valve replacement, this is uh, the typo there, is 5.88, but clearly uh, from an overall medical standpoint, he's much higher risk than that. Uh, you know, given his uh, COPD, his social issues, he's an active smoker, all those uh, I think would make this uh, case appropriate for my, uh, aortic valve in valve. So we can look, go further next slide to look at some of the uh, imaging here. So this is the uh, valve that uh, is very similar to what we see on fluoroscopy. It's the uh, magna uh, uh, valve, which is a bovine pericardial valve. And you can see here the 23 millimeter uh, valve has an internal diameter around 21, 22 millimeters. Uh, the particular in this case of a, a prosthetic AS is going to be a little bit smaller. And our plan is to implant a supraannular valve, which is the Evolute Pro Plus valve in this case, uh, for two reasons. One, uh, there is really uh, no concern with coronary obstruction here, given the root is very generous. We'll see that on the CT next. But also, uh, we want to give this patient the best hemodynamic performance possible uh, with a superannular uh, valve with low gradient. Given the last surgical valve was a bovine pericardial valve and the durability was only three years, Poor, poor sign pericardial valve in this case uh, may have some uh, benefit. We'll see how it goes uh, uh, over time, but that's uh, our rationale. Next slide. So you can see the CT scan uh, here shows the uh, annular dimensions of the, within the 23 magnet valves on 21, 22 millimeters. Uh, you can see here the angle is reasonable. Next slide. And you can see here the root is very generous. So there's no concern about coronary obstruction here at all. In fact, uh, to maximize the hemodynamics, we're going to uh, actually fracture this valve to make sure the evolute valve, once implanted, has the best possible frame expansion. You can see left main height is, uh, even though it's low, but the sinus tubular junction is so big that it's not going to be a concern for, for that. Next slide. Yeah, so clearly the, the leaflet, uh, it's a combination of the annular diameter and the leaflet, uh, and uh, in this particular case, uh, we actually are protected because of the large sinotubular diameter of uh, over 35 millimeter. So anything less than 30, you start worrying about, uh, and so, and of course, uh, the left main height of 10, but here is left main height is 8.3, but uh, because of the large sinotubular uh, junction. So one of the big issues happens with the valve and valve is obstruction of the coronary arteries with the new valve, and uh, there, there, there are various techniques which have been suggested with the basilica scalloping 
all the technique we have done few cases uh, silica but very complex you are basically you want to lacerate the uh, native uh, particularly the uh, bioprosthetic leaflet and uh, in particularly preventing the coronary obstruction so uh, uh, gilbert what do you think about uh, the whole process of this basilica and uh, scalloping of the uh, the bioprosthetic valve before putting it because we uh, most of the time when that question comes and this patient is intermediate risk and so we let the patient go for surgery yeah. rather than doing those heroic uh, uh, approach Right. Yeah. I mean, we first of all, yes. we don't have long-term data on basilica. Yeah. You yes. know, we don't know how whether the flow will be uh, sufficient, will be dead yeah, in the obstruction. I think it's a bailout. Yeah, it's Sorry? a bailout yeah. method uh, yeah. to uh, to avoid coin obstruction, but also we've done sometimes maybe easier to do a snorkel stenting. In fact, there was a study yeah. that compared yeah. snorkel stenting versus uh, basilica, and there's really no difference in 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 outcomes per se. So so as you know, Dr. Sharma, we just uh, yep. announced the, the SMART file, That's which right. is a small annulus, and yes. there is a valve and valve group That's in right. here for randomization. We're yeah. allowing Basilica, but it really is a very, um, you know, it's in cer certain centers. Right. It requires a certain uh, operator expertise, right. and the long-term outcomes, we just really have no idea, as, you, as you said. But I think the, the really issue here is that which valve and how do you choose? And right. I don't know that we have the definitive answer of which one of these right. valves is superior in terms of the hemodynamic and durability of the valve over yep. time, That's right. especially now that this surgical valve has failed. Yes. Um, so would you randomize a case like this in a trial of... Um, uh, of SMART? Yeah, I mean, the point, question is that yes, uh, there are some data that uh, one hemodynamically, and I'll show, share a little bit uh, in my presentation, that the hemodynamic point of view, particularly in the smaller valve, uh, the evolute gives you better hemodynamics. In the large valve, it's not that different. But in the smaller valve of 26, 23, and so it clearly uh, evolute gives you better hemodynamics, and uh, the whether it is will translate into a long-term benefit still need to be seen. We don't know so that yet. is the yeah. one exactly, big and issue. that's why you would yeah. be okay to randomize these patients. So coming back to the point of the coronary obstruction, so what we have actually uh, more relied on is the protection of the left main if patient has a, we actually had done one case both left main and rca protection both of them when we are worried about the coronary obstruction we are not that high on uh, basilica and other procedures as uh, but mentioned. you're not worried here is that right That's i mean right. in the, this the, particular the, case the, no so no. you would not be doing no. that okay in this Just particular see. case no but otherwise now femoral arterial access point of view uh, yeah gilbert yeah you can see that uh, this patient is on dialysis so clearly there is some peripheral vascular disease here thankfully the uh, the right side was favorable so we're able to uh, uh, advance uh, 18 French gore sheaf. Uh, we prefer to use a sheaf rather than inline to protect the artery so we can do an up over closure technique to avoid vascular complication. Very good. Okay, so then uh, about type 2 aortic arch. In this particular case, less of an issue about using sentinel. Yeah, this patient has a fistula, patient, so, yeah, fistula. Uh, so unfortunately so not that precludes issue. us from, yeah. uh, from no. using sentinel. Yeah. So this is the important point. So this particular case, what we are deciding here is that patient will get a uh, valve and valve tower using 26 millimeter evolute pro plus core valve in 23 millimeter magna valve was the right percutaneous femoral approach with balloon valve fracture using 23 millimeter true balloon what is the balloon valve fracture and this basically points down to the various commonly used surgical valve the red uh, type you cannot uh, uh, the fracture but the green one, you can fracture, and this is what well, magna valve is. Yes, the commonly used trifecta is the one which you cannot fracture. That's mm -hmm. right. You can yeah. model and stretch it, but you cannot break it. Correct. Yeah. And actually, uh, the lot of current aortic valves are being manufactured, keeping in this mind yes. when the time will come that they will be better suitable for the tower procedure. Mm -hmm. That's right. right. I mean, some of the valve changes are yeah, being made. Yeah. So, for present. example, the Edwards Inspiris valve has a hinge that can, uh, you know, loosen up when you do the uh, fracture, so you don't have to fracture, you just stretch it and you can implant. Now, we don't know the durability of that valve. We'll see uh, when the next 10, 15 years. We when need we the see durability valves. data are key exactly. here. Exactly. But okay. um, do you want to talk with uh, Dr. Dr. Kinney? You, uh, it was not so easy to, uh, I see you, you usually cross within a minute. Tell us what you did and what was your trick to get across. I uh, will talk. Are you finished with the case presentation? Yeah, case presentation is, yeah. Then I'll oh, mention. Yeah. Oh, we can show the floral. Floral, bring the floral now on the screen. 
Uh, uh, let's have the whole aogram so we'll understand why we are having trouble yeah, in crossing the valve. This is really important teaching point. So if you see here, the sinus is huge and then you have this uh, valve. Yeah. So I think uh, rightly so. Sahil Kera did uh, you know, warn me as I'm walking in that uh, this may be a difficult one to cross. Uh, so usually when you have a prosthetic valve like this, we go with the smaller, which is the normal teaching is that we would go for any uh, catheter to be uh, used. If you are using for a, a normal uh, uh, aortic valve, it will be AR2. But in yeah. this situation, we always say go AR1 and then use RAO view. Not LAO view, but RAO view because you will see um, how, uh, let me go to RAO and just tell you, see here, how your projection is. You will know exactly, you know, which way that you want to enter into the LV. But here, we had to go to multiple views. But since the, you know, the sinuses uh, were large, we tried, we went with the AR2, then tried with the, of course, AR1, but then AL1 did not, and then our AL2 is the one that actually helped us. We can show the fluoro save um, how actually we cross. So other trick also is that uh, you know you can watch um, as a stars is showing yeah. us the echo, uh, echo. You simultaneously check the echo, um, the catheter, you know which way it's facing, and you, the hole was closer to the left side. So AL2 actually guided us better. Uh, to get into that one tiny hole. Show the 3D. Like I think even in the 3D, we were able to see the opening was just on the left side. Everything else was, uh, you know, de uh, degenerated and, uh, um, right, mm -hmm. closed. Yeah. That is why AL2 actually helped. The other wire that we have, normally we will go with a straight uh, Tarumo wire. Uh, V18 is another one uh, that could be used. Uh, in this kind of situation, but V18 also did not help. So it was uh, AL2 guide and uh, uh, straight term mobile. Yeah. So this, if you see here, uh, we knew we are, we will see it more, more on the left side. We are trying, so, so it's, a, it's a gentle movement. You see that yeah, you, uh, see with it. the left side, you are just uh, moving the catheter back forth. So you're just facing it in the right spot. And from the right hand, you'll be moving your uh, wire to get in. Yeah. And particularly, irrespective, uh, this bioprosthetic valve to cross are very difficult. Um, I remember one yeah. time in the, uh, the TCT, they, yes. were, they have 45 minutes and they couldn't cross the valve. It was, yeah, yeah, so I the whole that. 45 minutes went just for the crossing. But yeah, they are always very difficult. But yes, uh, the various techniques which uh, had been mentioned here, uh, is, they are very helpful on this case and particularly it was AL2 because of the large aortic sinus that is goes against our teaching in crossing these valves. Yeah, and, and the view. Always yeah. I, uh, I teach, uh, you know, the fellows that uh, it has to be RAO because you're, uh, oh, you know, so, that. yeah, 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 that's all. And, and I think echo actually helped us. You could see it on the echo that opening is closer to the left side, which means AL2 was uh, taking us to the left sinus. Yeah. Okay. That's very, good. very interesting. So now what Great is the plan now? Point. You have a guide catheter, AL2 in the ventricle. So where are, and now show the gradient now, very high gradient. So I know that they got some gradient, but look at the actual gradient here. It's a tremendous, it's like 80 millimeter okay. gradient. Show they the hemodynamics, please. Me. There's too many people in there. Thank you. Here is your peak to peak gradient. We haven't seen the hemodynamics, Dr. Sharma. Can you show the hemo? Put the hemo in the side or bottom? Yeah, look no, at that. No, no. Yeah, we Put see it, it in now. the bottom all the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yes. like that. Very good. Or smaller, yeah, smaller. Yeah. yeah, good. Okay, in one side. Now. What's so, the next step now? So we what we will do the next step would be that we are going to use a regular J wire and then uh, we'll cross, change it to a pigtail. Then we'll go with the confida and then we will do the valve fracture. And before we do the valve fracture, we are going to show you the steps of how we are going no, to be look doing Look at the AL2 is pointing good. What's wrong in just putting a confida now? If AL2 is pointing appropriately, what your pigtail should do? Your AL2 is a bigger catheter compared to your see the floral. It's a good point that Dr. Shama is bringing to yeah. reduce uh, steps here. How, how comfortable you feel to put the confida now? 
since uh, lv is uh, i think the size is large yeah. Uh, yeah. we we should be okay with that if yeah. lv was small i would not have okay. agreed of uh, you know cutting short the step very good now anu uh, if in your aerogram which i would love to see again for a second the aerogram you can see that they might be a mismatch uh, you know a patient prosthesis mismatch no, no. or what do you think about that look at the size of the annulus and look at the size of the valve and this is important when you do valve in valve but yeah go ahead dr sharma no but uh, they actually did the careful analysis and they told us that uh, uh, it's not a case of uh, uh, the prosthetic patient mismatch okay no means we know the sinus is dilated okay we, it looks like that this is yeah. my say this is what happens when you cut short yeah didn't work yeah now now it also could be the confida the tip okay. of the confida could be destroyed yeah, give, give us that Why pigtail you again now you can do the pigtail no yeah pigtail we are doing the lerak is talking we don't hear lerak yeah, is yeah lerak is little louder by echo there is no evidence of uh, patient prosthesis mismatch okay. uh, the acceleration time that we measure is 120 milliseconds uh, uh, pressure uh, patient prosthesis mismatch is less than 100 and also the valve looks uh, very degenerated you know there is no Understood. the leaflets are thick and calcified don't open is so uh, tell us roughly uh, uh, it's time for all us to, to understand how would you make uh, this patient prosthetic mismatch now in this case uh, what are your criteria roughly yeah. you're looking at the with the body surface area and so yeah, yeah. i mean we look for uh, you know if with a transesophageal echo if you see the leaflets uh, you know thin or even not very uh, excessively thickened and they open you know and uh, you do the all the measurements mm -hmm. and uh, based also on the body surface area you know you can uh, measure uh, the, if there is significant uh, patient prosthesis uh, mismatch, which is uh, usually less than 0 0.5, less than 0 0.6 centimeters square uh, per um, meter square, so okay, uh, we we'll do all the measurements and uh, but also by seeing the valve by itself, if the leaflets open, most likely if you have a significant gradient, will be due to prosthesis, patient prosthesis mismatch, but this is clearly not the case, and sometimes. You also have fi uh, mixed findings, patient prosthesis mismatch and some degeneration. So ha you have to take everything into account. I think, uh, Stem, in the definition, it's uh, when the effective orifice area of the prosthetic valve is smaller than the orifice of the patient-aided valve with a ratio of 0 0.65 centimeters square yeah. per meter yeah. square. But can you actually measure the patient's original orifice valve when you have a prosthetic valve in? Uh, I mean, that's uh, very difficult to do, you know, but... Uh... How? Again, we take everything into account, you know, everything okay. into account, and also knowing the, knowing the size of the valve that the patient has, and, uh, and we can compare before and after the valve is placed, we can uh, make a determination. Okay. But, uh, Good. Good. Okay, now let's go full screen. Uh, operator? Uh, not full screen. Remove the echo. Half screen us. Now take the hemo out. Oh, you know what? You can put the hemo small in the side put the hemo below the fluoroscopy but right now, in the small but you show what you wanted yeah see this now this is so a essentially how you're going to crack the valve if you can no side below the fluoroscopy that they cannot okay then take it out take it off right now Good. show me full yeah okay so this is where uh, if you see here how we crack so this is the balloon which we have. What size okay. true balloon? True balloon is a 23 true balloon. So uh, you have a three-way stop cock, if you can see it. So I will be going completely using this syringe, dilate the balloon, and then, then you lock it. The syringe will be locked, and then after that, I will use this indeflator, keep going fast, and so that I'll crack it. So th those are the steps. Okay. But I thought that true balloon with a multi-layer, no matter how high you go, you cannot ex expand it further compared to a, 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 a Z-Med. 
remade yeah true balloon once it is inflated okay. you cannot go further it's a multi layer six multi layer balloon once it inflates you cannot increase the size further if the idea yeah. is pressure. to the pressure not pressure. not okay. the size itself okay. because you're good. constrained the pressure okay. is the one that will crack the valve all right so. very good let's see it the see radial to believe strength it. yeah yeah the size will there is just increasing yeah. once, pressure once it cross out so pull the wire a little bit yes, good very good 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 uh, now my Okay, patient could become, uh, you know, we'll be very long hypotensive, pacing long, long pacing, pacing run. run. So let's be ready to resuscitate. Okay. And okay. valve should be ready to deploy. Yeah. Valve okay. is ready, right? Good. Yeah. Okay, ready. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's go 180. Pacing 180. Show the hemo. Good. Okay, no pressure. Go. Yep. I'm good. So I'm locking, and now I'm going to start going. I'm 12, 14, 16. What's the pressure? Yeah, I'm 18. I think it's cracked. Correct. Yes, yeah. it's cracked. It's cracked. Good. Okay. I'm just coming down, and then I'm going to relieve, take out the balloon, deflate the balloon. Yes, balloon deflation. Off pacer. Good. Off pacer. Yeah. Now. Good. Pacer. Okay. Good. My resuscitate. Please. Good. So you see the pressure drop when you crack. You know, you you try to go up to 20 atmosphere and then you see it drop. That means it's okay. Uh, let's get the valve. Let's go. Yeah, negative, negative. Yeah, I'm One negative. Second. Yep. It's, Are uh, you it's showing the hemo? How much yeah. AI? No much AI. No, no much AI. Okay, we just okay, need no, a little no. resuscitation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. Okay. Blood pressure up. I mean, I don't see much. Need a little push. Be good. Can change angle. And. Uh, Okay, so. Did you see it uh, crack? Um, yeah, well, yeah, Stamatos Liracus. Well, the moderate AI. Yeah, that's okay, but we need uh, we need a little bit of ump on the ventricle. Yeah, ventricle yeah. has to come up. Yeah. So, okay, okay. Doctor Kini, cool. anesthesia is there, huh? Yeah. He's running yeah. the. Yeah. yeah. Let's give Epi Bolus direct. Go, 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 yeah. Go, go, go. High dose. Let's see the F. Yeah. We need more go, because pressure. Go, our go, pressure is go, low. Go, go, go. go. Keep going. We are going up with go, the valve. Go, go. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah, going, yeah. going. Okay. Are we in the right? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Keep going, keep going. Yeah, keep going. Ah, oh, yeah. pressure is coming uh, no. back. Yep. Just wait. A... Very tortuous. Should go. Yeah, do. Uh, yeah. We're gonna need more, stuff. more inotropic support yeah. now. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. We'll give a full epi. Yeah. Good. Let's start okay. opening. Okay. You don't even need a um, see, we can, uh, the speed. Yeah, yeah. It's more. It's yeah, yeah. nothing. Okay, okay, 80. No, no. Okay, that's it. Okay, wait. The okay, valve is good. Okay, Epi, um, Moy, push Epi. This is this stuff. Okay, mm -hmm. we got. We should. We should release the valve. Yeah, release the valve. Good. No, no, no. Are you sure it is? Yeah, okay. yeah, it's good. Yeah, good. No, no, go to LAO. 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 I'm with LAO. Yeah. Tee up, please. Tee up. Okay, no, no pressure. Okay, okay. And we okay, give okay. Epi. Okay. Release, the release. Rule yeah, four. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's go. Let's Why deploy. Let's go quickly. Let's okay, go good. quickly. Okay, good. Okay, okay. Valve is released. Okay, let's go in. Come up, come wire, out, wire. come out, yeah. wire out. I think you need CPR. When, okay. Wait a minute. Okay. No, 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 no. Patient, yeah, blood pressure coming up. Let's push now. Yeah. Yeah, coming up. Is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. coming yeah, up, good. coming up. Yeah, okay, very good. good, very good. Okay, a little bit more push, my. Yeah, yeah. Good. Go back okay. a bit. Go back a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is the ventricle moving? Yeah, EF, EF is yeah. uh, improving slowly. Come, come up. Uh, Yeah, yeah, no problem. Systolic is now 70s to 80s, so yeah. this is good. Excellent. So that is what we say basically. That one big, big, big major difference which nobody talks about, and I'm the biggest proponent of surgical valve replacement and tower. Yeah. Surgical valve replacement is a gradual process. We gradually do work. Pressure going, uh, patient getting anesthesia, more down, hemodynamic uh, disturbances going down, and so it takes time. While tower, it's a one instantaneous. So therefore, we all have split to be ready. Split of a second. A split of that. Yeah. Therefore, yeah. we need to be very, very prompt. Sometimes we overshoot it, which is okay. Like in this particular case, pressure yeah. is like 220, but we have learned that well, those so okay overshooting is fine uh, sure compared to undershooting. Yeah. And of course, overshooting you can always neutralize very quickly by giving additional vasodilator, nitroglycerin beta blocker or so. So yeah. clearly, we need to pull it down a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Yeah. It'll come down. Yeah. yeah. But I don't think we need to post. No. 
no, no. It's, it looks well expanded. Yeah. So what we always do, we we like to uh, uh, look at the cine picture of the valve in different views to confirm that we have a good expansion, especially after cracking. So you can see here. Uh, Sam, can you uh, bring the probe up a little bit, please, just to show the for the for, so the floral. So this is the coplanar view of the surgical valve. You can see even have good commissure alignment. Cine. Cine. And and then uh, we can go. Cinate, yeah, so okay. they can see to okay. And you can see here, this is well expanded on the RAO view as well. So, cracked it well. Yeah. So we craft it really well. It's, and it's well called expanded. as lesion preparation. Yeah. Okay. Lesion preparation. Let's go to our, our cracking Valve position. Preparation. One second. Yes. When we did the crack. I'm sorry. No, yeah. one second. Yeah. Yes, you You're can see, see. See, look right there. Did you see yeah. that right yeah. there on the on the spot? Yeah. The, you, we can actually on go the back left and side see. of the screen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks very nice. Just show it. Uh, Sharma or somebody show it okay, for the yeah. audience. It looks very, very nice. Uh, somebody has to highlight it. Um, we yeah. can, we can, you can okay. see it right on the, where the pacemaker wire lead exactly. crosses the surgical valve, where there. Just look at that, yeah. this suddenly gave away. See that? Yeah, yeah, suddenly gave away. One, two, boom. three, then. Broke. Yeah, boom. Yeah, yeah right see there. See the ring broke. Yeah. That's the key. See this? It's good, and down. Oh. It's cracked. Oh. Yeah. Where to go there? Yeah. 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 No, no, but he understood the, the yeah, lower one yeah, yeah, yeah. at the level of the pacemaker. Right yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, See, yeah. the continuous this ring? Is before, yeah. after. Yeah, yeah. before yeah. and after. Yeah. All right. So let's do the autogram. Yeah. Okay. But also, you see that crack caused some uh, instability. That is why yes. the valve had to yeah. be ready. What yeah. I meant is the three positions, which is the f first operator, the second operator, and the third operator, have to, you know, have. Uh, Okay. Oh, oh, going behind. Good. Aorta is so dilated. Yeah. Good. Let's just do what it. What about the Wait. echo? We Are we doing it now? Echo. Let's do the autogram first. Go. Yeah. Okay. okay. Ready? Yeah. What is this one? Okay. Very good. No die, but let's do it <laughs> once again. Yeah. Let's do a good one. Yeah. Die less. <laughs> okay. Die less autogram. <laughs> wow! Very nice, perfect depth. Yeah. Good. Beautiful. Okay, now the echo team can tell us what to what we have. Three and six. Yeah, you should be having it. Wow. Leaflets open in nicely. Oh, and uh, with the color, minimal AI as you can see uh, below the yeah. anterior leaflet, but. Yeah. Uh, Everything is looks great. No pericardial effusion. Good. No rupture. And uh, nothing but everything is great. EF and hemodynamics is very good. Yeah. Nicely much. controlled pressure of 140 or 80. Yeah. yeah. You, you look at the ventricle. It's coming yeah. back. Of course, with yeah. the inotropic support, yep. but it's yeah, already EF is much better. Baseline. It's at baseline. Yeah. EF has improved. Yes. EF yep. is uh, maybe 25, 25, 30%. And the RV also bit much better. No, no, what I meant, we knew it was 25. Uh, did it come to closer to 40? No, yeah, a few years <laughs> ago, so. it was 40. It was never normal as far as we knew. So it, our goal is that if aortic yeah. stenosis caused this LV deterioration, he should go back to that 35, 40 number oh, compared to 20, 25, where he started. Yeah, definitely. Now, yes. There are cases, uh, Stam, you know, that as soon as we change the valve, we have seen improvement in uh, EF. Yeah, if this you see the gastric view and you remember the image before, yes. Yeah. Look at this. Look at this. Much improved. Before it was not was yeah. not moving. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And uh, here is the valve. As I say, minimal AI. Excellent. And let's measure the gradient by real life. You start doing closure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so big big gradient of uh, yeah. Much yeah. Better. What is the peak gradient now? Let's talk about that. I don't what think is the residual gradient? gradient? Yeah, the peak gradient is, uh, the velocity is 3, we can trace it. Three. That's a lot. Why don't you measure it by hemodynamics? Is that yeah, too much to yeah. ask? Um, Maybe too much to ask. Peak gradient of 16 <laughs> from 53. Was 53 before 16 now. Yeah, so I think oh, the 16, key is... Beautiful. Yeah. So about uh, 15 or so. No, your max so is 34. We'll always leave it. So what has been shown mm -hmm. that you should not leave more than 20. So And I'll show you some data that so 20 is kind of cut off. So you want to keep it less than 20. Of course, some cases you have no choice. But try to say that <coughs> if you achieve what we achieve now, yeah. less than 20 is a good result. 
excellent results actually. Yeah, and this, for these valves, the core more? valve huh? gives a residual <laughs> gradient that is lower than the sapien. Is that a correct statement, Dr. Speak. Sharma? Yeah. So question comes is that, yes, uh, that uh, the weather, which valve is better? You know, we have the valve choice article uh, published in uh, JAMA Cardiology. Last month, we got a lot of uh, uh, positive reviews with that. And, uh, and basically, that what we saw, my literature search showed that once you're going beyond 26 millimeter, the, the, what is the residual gradient is also dependent what was your original pathology was, whether it was aortic stenosis or was aortic stenosis regurgitation or it was aortic regurgitation. So people with the aortic regurgitation have a lesser gradient at follow-up, so even with the valve and valve tower. Second, there is a clear-cut gradient when you are doing a 23, 26, or 29 millimeter tower valve. Okay. So it turns out to be that once you have 29, there is not much different. It is 26, like there is a slight difference, but 23, See. that's where you have a major difference See, yeah. in favor that's, that's, of the self-expanding okay. valve compared to balloon expandable. Uh, Gilbert, you want to comment on that? Can you yeah, take out the T? I think the issue is more on this, uh, the small surgical valves. Yeah. Just, uh, that's why we, we try to fracture if the anatomy is feasible. You don't want to obstruct the coronaries uh, by fracturing, but certainly the small surgical valve, 19, 21, and even 23 surgical yeah. valve are the problem with the gradients uh, with valve in valve. You know, if you look at the fluoroscopy image now, yeah. the, the prosthetic valve, the previous prosthetic valve, have that annulus is a continuous radio opaque line. Right now, you don't see that, and you actually see the expansion. Yeah. On just on correct. fluoroscopy, which is unbelievable. Yep. yep. So the truly you fractured. You know, there is no yeah. question. Now go back to hemodynamics, please. So we, our moderator, Dr. Marano, wanted a true hemodynamics of the cath lab, and we are going to show <laughs> that. Plus the side one. Yeah. The red. Sure. Red has to be. Sure. So it, but use, use a double lumen, okay. huh? because... No, no, no. We have, we he, have, we let's have both. See. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no gradient. Yeah, yeah. yeah. zero. So about same. About uh, 10, maybe. 10 to 15, that's what they found. What happened? Let's see. This is with the femoral artery, no. huh? Uh, yeah. No, but the same. It's no, a, central a, pressure. It's LV a, and a, aorta. Aorta. LV and aorta. Oh, yeah, LV and aorta. And look at yeah. the ascending part of the aortic curve. It's, yep. it's much better. Yeah. I mean, still yeah. a little yeah. anachronic, but... Yeah, which it will be. 10 millimeter gradient. Yeah, Good. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yes. while we are completing, and I'll complete my uh, topic, uh, go over to the slides, please. And uh, the here, our Sunny and uh, uh, Sahil will do the uh, closure and uh, will take about 10 minutes to go through the latest data in the valve and valve tower versus V2 sour in bioprosthetic aortic valve degeneration. And actually, I'll tell you that I have found little difference uh, uh, the two data presented. Uh, last series That's this year, idea. one plus one negative, but we'll go through it. Now, question is, we know the tower has evolved over the last decade, with leading to class 2A still, because we don't have the updated ACC guideline, but we know, knowing the CMS and FDA has approved it, I'm sure guideline will become yes, class yeah. one for even in the low risk patient, and that is what we are doing based on the trials of right, uh, partner three and evolute uh, yeah. R. Now, we also learned some procedural, acute procedural complication. This uh, nice uh, uh, editorial by Grube, that once you are done from the acute process, what are the factors for the long term? We are not talking about patients who died at the time, aortic rupture and all this happened. We are beyond. What are the, the procedural complications which impact long term outcome? And they actually put a big five, which is a nice one. One is stroke, yeah. paravalvular leak, acute kidney injury, uh, AV block, and bleeding. And actually, uh, you saw that acute kidney injury, a patient who developed AKI after tower has almost one year 50% mortality. So very high. So these are the factors, and of course, we know about the stroke and the paravalvular leak and so. And that will come into equation. Now, knowing that structural valve degeneration takes place, uh, we do, whether it's a surgical valve or the tower valve, and of course, they, it goes through the regular process. And this is actually has been the definition of the structural valve degeneration. One of them is that if uh, increase in the mean gradient of more than 10, particularly when gradient was uh, the more than 20. And so, so multiple definitions have come. This is a, another, really they have put it together now. 
बायोप्रोस्थेटिक वाल डिसफंक्शन विच आर द मल्टीपल फैक्टर्स ऑफ द स्ट्रक्चर वाल डिटोरिएशन तो वाल डिटोरिएशन इज वन देन यू कुड हैव द बेसिकली द डिटोरिएशन और रिवर्सिबल पर्टिकुलर लाइक एंडोकार्डाइटिस थम्बोसिस एंड देन नॉन स्ट्रक्चरल विच वी टॉक अबाउट पैरावेलर लीक एंड पेशेंट और prosthetic patient mismatch so key is that various degrees of structural wall deterioration can take place which is a part of the bioprosthetic wall dysfunction this very nicely illustrated until now we used to just talk about structural wall deterioration but now we are talking about more important based on the work 3 definition that bioprosthetic wall dysfunction has three component one is the structural wall deterioration which is permanent which is what happens with time Uh, and then gradient increases then second is reversible thrombosis or endocarditis and of course some of the thrombosis can give rise to wall deterioration structural wall deterioration and then is the non uh, structural wall dysfunction based on basically your patient prosthetic mismatch and paravalvular leak so all these things comes in so now i'll ask uh, gilbert on talk about this uh, valve and valve transcatheter uh, versus uh, scvr for this aortic valve replacement particularly with the degenerated he actually published this paper in ajc uh, with the trend in last 4 5 6 years gilbert you want to say yeah well we know that for nadia taver has already exceeded the volume of all surgical aortic valve replacement in the united states so what we find now with valve and valve taver uh, provided the patient's high surgical risk that's the indication right now that is also exceeding redo uh, trans, uh, surgical aortic valve replacement over the last several years we don't have the current data yet the last couple of years because of the um, nld database but uh, certainly I, i would expect that now the number of valve and valve taver probably exceeded the redo surgical aortic valve isolated surgical yeah. right and also by the indication it is only used for intermediate to high risk the it's valve and valve right i valve mean valve is a high surgical risk. risk of course you know that's like this patient is high surgical risk clearly despite the respect of age yeah. yes and that too is still not a class 1 yeah. uh, it will be a like 2a yeah. and this is actually just put it together height of the red bar is the redo sour and uh, the blue is the valve and valve that all outcomes were lower with a valve and valve compared to redo sour yes. so this is one of the propensity score match analysis which was published now we also know that valve and valve tower has a lower complication compared to native aortic valve so native so just like restenotic lesion what we do in pci uh, the restenotic lesion we do pci lower complication than native vessel native uh, lesion so same way valve and valve compared to is not true for redo surgical valve so this is where the basic issue will come why valve and valve is have a lower complication uh, when it is done for the uh, bioprosthetic degeneration compared to native valve but if you do a surgical valve for the bioprosthetic degeneration they have a two to three times higher mortality I mean, Gilbert, I think I think we can take this case as example, right? I mean, look at I mean, despite the low EF, the the technical difficulties, this patient can go home tomorrow. Literally speaking, you know, after dialysis, if you had to do a re-obstetronomy with the patient active smoker, dialysis, and other uh, risk factor PVD, he's going to be here at least for one week, if not longer, just to recover physically um, from the operation. Not that it's not technically not doable, but it's the recovery, and that's what you see in the outcomes uh, that's published and presented. Right. So basically, same as mentioned with the TVT registry database, and so so if you have an original surgical valve. Uh, in the not TVT or STS uh, database, like overall surgical mortality is about 1.3, 1.5%. It almost becomes three times four plus when you are you doing a redo sour because part of that patients are more complicated, have more more comorbid and conditions. And this is also. a nationally represented example, yeah. right? Remember, like, on average, a cardiac surgeon does five AVLs a year yeah. on average. Yeah. Very few. So can imagine redo is even lower. so now now the second question comes is here this is a representative slide of people always talk about balloon expandable heart valve versus self expanding heart valve and baseline and more important is on the right side what is your gradient residual gradient at discharge and it's dependent on as i mentioned whether you have used a 23 ma valve 26 or 29 as you see at 29 there is identical gradient it is only when you get to the 23 and 26 23 tremendous 
uh, with the balloon expandable, you leave a gradient of uh, almost 25, 30% all the time. And that number goes down to about 18. And of course, uh, the, the, put it together that if you talk about the balloon expandable, if your residual gradient is 20 or 40, so some cases a balloon expandable, you may still end up in leaving a gradient around 40. But question is that gradient does not happen in patients with the self-expanding valve. So now let's talk about the two major papers which have been published this year. One of them is the same valve and valve on the same concept of the treatment of the degenerated biological prosthesis. This is the data, administrative database from Ontario, Canada, where they took five-year outcome of the failed bioaortic valve, valve and valve tower 214 patients with a redo sour 344. And then they have the propensity match 131 patients. So what did they find? Actually, in this study, you can see there is a lower mortality, means improved survival in valve and valve at five years compared to redo sour. And of course, the readmission, although shown on the right side, the cumulative uh, non-significant trend. So if we, uh, and then of course, uh, freedom from Mackey is identical, non-significant. Uh, and if you put it together, that short term, 30 day outcome favors valve and valve tower. No question about, we know all the time. Short length of stay, less rebleeding, less AFib, and so. But question is, what happens on the long run? Now, long run in this Canadian story, the registry report, you actually have an improved survival, 76.8 versus 66.8, almost 10% difference in favor of valve and valve tower at five years compared to redo sour. Of course, the readmission was higher, uh, non-statistically higher, uh, and that led to a little higher Mackey, but seems to be that one report showed that valve and valve tower has a trend, because p-value was just 0 0.05 uh, in favor of valve and valve tower compared to redo. So they basically said that it is a good technique. Now, at the same time, and they have actually basically uh, the editorial very nicely pointed out that uh, it's uh, although the panacea for the failed bioprosthetic valve, both surgical and tower may not yet be there, but could still be the beginning of an exciting new paradigm in repeat aortic valve intervention that you have to consider knowing that right now, low risk surgical bioprosthetic degeneration are not getting the valve and valve. They are going for surgery because it's not an indication at present. Even intermediate is just barely making a, a class 2A. Now, second report, which is not, uh, again, the literature is all full of various opinions. So this is a report of same process of valve and valve versus redo. And this is from the French registry. Large database of last 10 years, 4,000 uh, 4, plus patients, 717 7, match patients. With a good follow-up of four years, they presented their data. Now, let's see what happens here. So, what they found, that of course, uh, if you match population, half of them, they were both. Balloon expandable about 46.7, self-expanding 53. And these are the various characteristics. So, nicely matched patient population, and they have the Euro score uh, about 4.7 in both of them. So these are the individual 30-day endpoint. As you can see, uh, valve and valve tower, favored 30-day endpoint. So far, the story looks very good. Now let's go further. Uh, what happens after home, after the discharge? And look at this one, the incidence of combined endpoint of mortality, stroke, MI, and major life-threatening bleeding. You can see the blue bar or red. Red is tower, valve and valve tower, and blue is surgery. And at about two years, the it start crossing in favor of redo sour compared to tower. So how do we, uh, uh, Gilbert, and then I ask uh, Anno, that how do we can reconcile the two major database? Again, these are the propensity match. They are not randomized trial, but one had totally contrary uh, results compared to this. Here, it makes you believe that after to look at the four year, the difference between two, and so also is mortality. So you always worry about mortality. Same message is for the mortality that you, uh, after two years, you start having a higher mortality in valve and valve tower compared to redo sour. I think we should definitely talk one, uh, one minute about this, uh, two disparate results of the two trials. 
I think I think first of all, there's always an inherent selection bias. Even though you can propensity match, you're not going to count all the factors. Yeah. You know, like frailty, for example, or other uh, non-captured uh, medical field. Because remember, all the database has driven research. So whatever you put in is how you can analyze. But if you don't include certain variables, you're not going to be comparing those. So I think there's inherent selection bias in each of the papers showing the differences. And you know, there are two different uh, ge geography. So uh, you know, we don't we don't know um, what the underlying differences are. But I think that's that. That's what, why I think there are discrepant results. And they did also mention that in the last two years, even in the French registry, the outcomes of the mortality no longer became significant. Right. Means that they did a better job of valve and valve tower, and particularly many of them they did a fracture. Yes, so because the technique improvement, and they definitely the in first four five years they noted, but last two three years that difference was no longer there. Anu? No, is it uh, that intermediate high risk were all valve in valve? Low risk went to reduce our. No, their propensity match. Yeah. So that but way, your score. That way, they match. You are right. That is the regular practice. But in this 717 patients, which they had, they were matched patients. Okay. So they, yeah. And the type of valve, which we just discussed, like uh, you know, Gilbert and you mentioned that was the valve cracked. What was the final outcome right. with the you know? Valve? That's why I think mortality probably is different based on residual gradient. Uh, even though they are valve in valve and what yeah. kind of valve were used you know those a lot of these minor things uh, which should be taken into account i think the biggest uh, issue could be overall patient uh, um, uh, you know what's the kind of the patient like we just mentioned because frailty index nobody takes into account uh, only certain you know numbers are taken into account to go get sts uh, score but frailty is a big d, uh, big thing for uh, all of us in this elderly population very good. So new onset AFib, repeat hospitalization, pacemaker implantation, as you see here, again favored. So I put it together in the bar graph, death, stroke, the hospitalization for heart failure, combined endpoint, and new onset AFib. So even AFib actually was surprised with no difference between two studies. I yeah. mean, two, two groups. Yeah, you will expect it, that surgical group will correct. have a higher AFib, correct. but not in this yeah. uh, registry data. Uh, but hospitalization definitely for heart failure was much higher uh, as shown here. But overall, not. Now, also very important. As I said, time-dependent phenomena occurred in this, that in the later part, no difference in mortality. And also they found, once you go to the lower Euro score, which uh, briefly eluded uh, by Dr. Keeney, the lower Euro score, actually, you have favor the, the reduced sour. But once you have a high Euro score, actually, although not, statistically not significant, but it favor valve and valve tower. And that is what our practice is. In intermediate, usually actually high risk, valve and valve is approved and with a two-way indication and so. So clearly, I think uh, here, they do, don't mention that in the overall conclusion. They say identical outcome, but we saw things separating after uh, two years and so. So they, we know that after two years is a trouble. So lastly, uh, that basically, so nice editorial by Raj Makkar and the group, but I would say we need a randomized trial of valve and valve tower or reduced sour in degenerated bioaortic valve prosthesis, maybe somebody with a little higher baseline risk and there is a no uh, con coronary obstruction. So the question comes, what are the regions, if at all? So this I have, I have put it together that possible explanation for higher follow of mortality after valve and valve tower versus sour. One of them is there is a prosthesis patient mismatch, which could happen largely because of the constraint of the original valve. Second, higher paravalvular leak, which have been shown. Uh, of course, surgery, there will be no paravalvular leak. Then increased rehospitalization rates because of high paravalvular leak, higher need for permanent pacemaker. Some patient develop pacing-induced cardiomyopathy. And there are some question about valve thrombosis due to aortic sinus flow or delayed coronary obstruction with the valve and valve could happen. Now, this is just a very, to like FYI, patients, since we are following more and more patients, now we are seeing that valve, the tower valve is being explanted for various regions, many of them because of endocarditis coronary obstruction. They are going for <laughs> some other region. So they are explanting the valve, although number is about 0.2. And you can see here, if explantation takes place, majority happened within one year. 71% of the explant happened within uh, one year. And of course, uh, in the past, explantation they have a higher mortality, but now it has gone down. And they actually have shown that we need to worry about the tower explantation uh, in the times to come. So just put it together, that update our take-home message. The first one is 
the redo sour is associated with higher surgical mortality hence valvinol tower is increasingly be used to treat bioprosthetic aortic valve degeneration we know particularly in intermediate to high risk usually high risk and the short term out short term outcomes favors valvinol tower versus redo sour but long term outcomes in at 4 to 5 years are conflicting why we got two reports large french registry showed higher mortality and higher hospitalization canadian registry showed lower mortality and trend towards therefore our randomized trial is clearly needed so quickly i want to finish it now we are getting to our time uh, that following are the included in the reported big 5 complications of tower having adverse long term outcome except stroke effective tower valve area bleeding and paravalvular leak and you know the valve area has not uh, correlated yet in terms of overall outcome then following the true statement regarding valve valve tower versus redo sour in degeneration aortic valve degeneration except that valve valve tower has a higher frequent hospitalization valve valve tower consistently has higher long term mortality Valvinol tower has higher 30 day mortality and adverse outcomes and valvinol tower has higher incidence of coronary obstruction we say answer is c that it's not higher 30 day mortality rather lower so then last question that following are the possible explanation for higher adverse outcome after valvinol tower versus surgery in degenerative aortic valve higher paravalvular leak higher residual gradient um higher valve thrombosis higher stroke rate stroke rate has not been different and that's i conclude my today's presentation and here uh sail can just show the full closure if we can show the uh, go back to anjo yeah. yeah so tell us if you close this right so this was a very calcified test with the calcified patients we are uh, sort of seeing a very calcified uh, tram track appearance so uh, luckily we stuck at 90% of the femoral head so it was a very high stick we balloon tamped with just a couple of minutes and we have excellent closure so there's no reason patient should not be able to go home tomorrow beautiful now the, for the vascular access sir remember now we are are we using ultrasound and so, uh, under or you just go with ct guided right so we do ct guided uh, planning then we use ultrasound and micropuncture uh, for our uh, vascular access to avoid the calcium correct yeah because that's that's the way to go with this yep okay So with right. that, uh, we conclude our today's structural webcast. Very good. So thank you so much. I want to uh, congratulate uh, the team and thank you for Dr. Carlos Nieves from Puerto Rico who sent us regards. We appreciate your email and your questions for the next time. Yeah, it was a it was a really extremely illustrative and uh, teaching. case um a lot of things to learn very evolving a, a very beautiful evolving field and but most importantly <clears throat> remember that december the 10th we have our new york valve symposium the mount sinai new york valve symposium so get in your calendars free december the 10th is a thursday and register you can do that today at www.nytranscatheterbalves.org the the symposium directors that are the same that you saw today we will welcome you for a fantastic full day of live cases uh, and register um, uh, meetings as well as questions live questions so thank you see yeah, us 6 hours only so thank you so much and i'll see you remember the next tuesday is going to be in january the second tuesday of the month we always do it at 9am the second tuesday every two months so it will the next one will be in january thank you so much